So if everybody, so hi, good evening. Um, and I am completely delighted to be welcoming Sterling Bates, um, who is going to be talking to us about 19 ways to fix all of your relationships. And Sterling is someone who's well known to the type community. And he uh, combines technology, mathematics, business, marketing, organizational development, and psychological type, and has founded his own organization called Step Research, which is a psychology software company. Um, and previously before that, he worked at Disney for 13 years in IT and marketing and was on the back board for four years. So with no further ado, I will hand over to you, Sterling. And uh, we are really looking forward to what you're going to be sharing with us. Great. All right. Um, just want to make sure I've got the uh, video so I can watch your faces at the same time. That's not interfering with the sharing of the screen, is it? Everything looks good? Looks just fine for me. Great. All right. So 19 ways to fix all of your relationships. Oh, no. So, hello. All right. So uh, here's what we're gonna, here's the agenda. Uh, why you should invest in your relationships, some common challenges that we want to address. Some, we're gonna talk briefly about some bad solutions, some solutions I'm gonna urge you to avoid. Mm. Why type? And then of course, 19 solutions in the wake of COVID-19. So the slides and links are gonna be available after. Um, and I have a lot of links and material reference I'm going to make during this presentation, and those are going to be available afterwards in a couple of additions, not only this, but in several PDFs. So I'm going to have two handouts. One is an action handout. So for all 19 of the fixes, there's going to be specific a recommended action you can take proactively in your life. And I also have a checklist handout for all the different things I'm going to reference, the materials, links, books. So don't panic. Don't feel like you have to take you know, fast notes. Um, thank goodness this is being recorded. Um, but on top of that, you're going to get access to the slides, the resource handout, and then an action list. So I'm going to make sure you have lots of resources when you're done to um, take advantage of this. So why should you come invest in your relationships? Well, this is actually the reason I came to type in the first place. Um, in the modern world, I think a vast number of life problems are actually relationship-based. And, you know, I first came to type because I was interested in solving my own development and solving my own relationships. So some of the first books I got were all about romantic relationships and impersonal relationships and type, not to try to solve work problems, but just try to solve personal problems. But it turns out how much of our stress in life comes from conflict with other people. And the answer is a whole bunch of it, especially in the modern world. Further, if you look at the one, Harvard did a longitudinal study on the outcomes of people, and it's, um, there's also a TED talk, there's also a link to the study, but for more than 75 years, they followed a large cohort of individuals, and when the study began, nobody cared about empathy or attachment, but they began to find the key to happy and healthy aging is relationships, relationships, relationships. Their words, not mine. The as a quote, the clearest message that we get from this 75 year study is good relationships keep you happier and healthier, period. The number one driver for life satisfaction is your relationships. Another way to phrase this, the really surprising finding is that our relationships and how happy we are in our relationships have a powerful influence on our health. The clearest message we get from 75 year studies is this, good relationships keep us happy and healthier, period. So. Um, another way to think about this is that loneliness kills. It is as powerful as smoking or alcoholism. It's not just the number of friends you have. It's not whether or not you're in a committed relationship. And it's the quality of your close relationships that matters. Um, in the book Friends by Robin Dunbar, he collects a lot of this medical and health research that you can find referenced in his book. I think it's a great resource if you want to know more about how this all fits together. Um, and there are a number of other studies that continue to report effectively the same pattern over and over again, that it's about your social support that really determines your health. Loneliness or having few friends um, gives you a reduced immune response. Um, also, 
uh, looking at a lot of epidemiological. So these are like literally health and body studies that reduces your chance of heart attack or strokes. The point is, is that your, your relationships define in many ways your physical health. Um, and that is one of the things that just study after study continues to show in the modern era. And I think there's a lot of people who aren't familiar with how many of these studies have now begun to show this. Another meta study of 3.5 million people that fact things like social isolation, living alone, uh, um, and feeling lonely increased your chances of dying by 30%. Oh, there are very few risky things you can do that make that are that risky. And if you're looking for more on how dangerous loneliness is, there's a wonderful book on it. Um, also, they've shown that joining community organizations can reduce your um, uh, risks by up to two thirds. And so really, when I say investing in your relationships, even if you have selfish reasons <laughs> and you care less about the people in your life, you should care about the relationships for your own uh, personal development, your own happiness and satisfaction and your own physical health. Um, now, it turns out the world had another curveball for us, um, COVID. And that resulted in lots of isolation, disappearance for many people of most of their social activities, a massive reduction in important social traditions and less physical contact. So what I wanna do here is have a poll where I'm gonna ask how COVID has most affected your relationships. So Sarah, if you could help me by popping up that first poll. There you go. So did it make most better or deeper? For some people, it enabled them to be really focused on the relationships that matter. They were more at home with them. Did it help some make better, but some worse? Was a few better, but many worse? Or did it make most of them worse? So for you, um, what was the impact of COVID on the relationships in your life? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop there and let's share the results. So if everyone can see those results, yes. Great, so yeah. So the good news is, is that um, we're at least um, socially skilled enough and competent enough and developed enough that we did not get to made most worse. <laughs> go us, congratulations. However, for most of us, there are definitely some relationships that got worse. And I would say this is incredibly common for most people a big chunk of their relationships got worse, which is certainly the largest percentage here. And I think that that's sadly normal. All right. So one of the questions we have is how do we make our lives better in response to this challenge? How do we make our relationships better even though all of this has happened? And so a number of different responses are available to us. We can build on new habits, we can repair damaged relationships, rebuild social networks, and establish new friends. And all of those will be discussed in different ways throughout the 19 solutions we're gonna talk about to make your relationships stronger and better. So again, from my perspective, the greatest return on investment you can make of your time and energy to make in your own life comes from investing in your deep personal relationships. Almost nothing is worth more of your time than that. So that could be your romantic partners, your close friends, your business partners, your coworkers. Now, some common challenges. Um, first, I'm going to reference John Gottman, who's done a lot of great work in the work of relationships. If you're not familiar with his work. Um, he was recognized in 2007 as one of the most 10 most influential therapists of the past quarter century. I'm listing two books that I think may be relevant in this space. Um, the book, uh, the, um, the Science of Trust, I think is great for all relationships, not just romantic. Um, but he identified what he called the four horsemen. These are the four, the four things that sign um, real concern in a relationship. Um, and we want to, and I'm going to talk about each of these briefly. So the first is criticism. So this is a verbally attacking the personality or character of another person. By the way, this is not just expressing a complaint or a concern, <laughs> right? There's a difference between, hey, you didn't call when you said you would, a complaint, and how come you never think of me, <laughs> which is now more of a personal attack. So note the difference there. So criticism is attacking their personality or character, which when you're upset begins to say is something that many, most of us can do. The second is contempt. This is a really bad sign if you see this. So it's attacking this sense of self with an intent to insult or abuse. Ways we do this is 
methods of disrespect, mocking them with sarcasm, ridicule, call them names, or something that some of us have done using body language, such as eye rolling or scoffing is a sign of contempt. And it's designed to make the person feel despised and worthless. And it is very unfun to be on the receiving end of contempt. Three, defensiveness. So this is victimizing yourself to ward off a perceived attack and reverse the blame. And it's a typical response to criticism. We've all been defensive at different times. And it's nearly always there in relationships that are in deep trouble, but we, it's one of those moments when we fish for excuses and play the innocent and hoping that our partner will back off. But unfortunately, the strategy is almost never successful. Um, it tells our partner that we don't take their concerns seriously and that we don't take responsibility for our mistakes. And finally, for stonewalling. So that's withdrawing to avoid conflict and convey disapproval, um, creating a distance of separation. And often that can be in response to contempt, but it means um, turning out, turning away, acting busy or engaging in obsessive or distracting behaviors instead of paying attention to your partner, especially when your partner is making a bid for your attention. So the four horsemen, criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stole alarming, what I'd like you to do is take a moment at this list. And I want you to think about which one of these four drives you the most crazy when someone in your life does it to you. Just go ahead and take a few moments, look at this list. I'm gonna give everyone a, just a little bit here to think about which one of these drives you crazy. Want me to launch the poll? Yes, that'd be great. Thank you, Sarah. So now again, just answer for yourself. Which of Gottman's Four Horsemen most drives you crazy? By the way, on a side note, they all suck. Just in case anybody's curious. <laughs> That's really not, <laughs> we do know that. All right, I'm going to end and share here. There you go. So there, N nice escalation. Look at that nice little graph there. Cri criticism is contempt and defensiveness. So all, again, they all suck. Now, I I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pause for a second and I'm gonna ask the question a different way. Um, which one of these have you most done to other people? We all have our bad days. Which are the ones that you are most guilty of? So take a second of this list and uh, think about which one is the one where you've been the one uh, to do that. Which one have you done to other people most? Go ahead and think about that. And Sarah, go ahead and pop up the poll, please. There you go. Thank you. All right, there we go. So it looks a little bit differently. Uh, so now you got criticism that pops up and stonewalling, yep. And obviously there might be some um, interesting type trends. I'm not sure that Gottman uses type in his research, but I wouldn't be surprised if you wouldn't see some type trends into which, which activities different people do depending upon their personality type. Um, so, uh, but this is a good example of we can look at these and go, what drives me crazy? But it's really valuable to do that look inward from a self-development standpoint and our own development and say, which one am I doing to other people? When am I doing the thing that really annoys me? All right. Okay. Um, he's also identified a number of other challenges in his book, Science of Trust. So he goes a lot more into some of the mechanics of some of the different ways it can go. So if you want to dive more, into some of this great research into relationships, I recommend this book, Science of Trust. Another factor is that the purpose of marriage for many people and for society has changed over time. For marriage 100 years ago was not really about love or fulfillment. Often it was about pragmatic family and economic values. But the modern era 
of marriage said that not only should marriage provide love and fulfillment, but in the modern world, there's a certain amount of expectation that your married partner can and should be all things to their partner. Your best friend, your conversation partner, your hobbies, you should do everything together. It should be all together. And that's a really insanely high expectation of any person, let alone someone you love. Um, if you want more on this particular model, it's called the suffocation model of marriage by Ellie Finkel. And she likes to describe it as that all of us are trying to count Mount Maslow, Maslow as we go through our life to get improved higher and higher. And then just when you're trying to fulfill all this for another person, there's just not enough oxygen to go around. We're asking so much of marriage and there's a link to her paper. There's a lot of expectations and not enough effort to match it for many people. Another challenge is um, I like to think of this, um, if anybody's familiar with the book, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, he calls it rule three, which is don't make assumptions. And there's a really important psychological concept that underpins this idea of don't make assumptions. And that is, is the theory of mind. We all have a theory of mind about who other people are and why they do things. We're constantly trying, and I've noticed the emphasis on the word there, imagine what people in our lives are thinking. We don't know what they're thinking. Um, we're guessing what people are thinking and why they do the things they do. And so this is some of the biggest causes of relationship trouble. Um, uh, and many people can offer solutions to these problems. And now we're gonna talk about some of what I think of as the solutions you can avoid like the plague. Please do not endorse these solutions. So first, the, some of these solutions are being advertised as being helpful with relationships, but they often fail to meet the need of most relationships or trouble. So the first one I'm gonna, and I'm sorry if this is anybody's favorites, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. If uh, you've not heard of this book, fantastic. Great, keep it that way, pretend I didn't mention it. Um, the biggest problem here is it's mostly just cultural norms and stereotypes. It has no nuance for things like men with feeling preferences or women with thinking preferences. And it doesn't take into account any kind of non-binary choices around gender or sexuality. Another one that sometimes is really problematic can be horoscopes, um, because if anything, they increase the chance of a misplaced expectation in a relationship, which is always a bad sign. Because anything that indicates your relationship is predetermined and that you don't have any opportunity to make it what you should make it is where you get into trouble. So now I'm going to give a bad whole type example in our own community. And I really want to thank Teresa Moon for her presentation about 2021 for this find. So a shout out to our uh, last year presentations. Um, this is literally on a website online where someone has put together a chart telling you which relationship people should be with which people based upon their personality type. It predetermines your relationship success based upon your personality type. By the way, in case I wasn't clear, this is bad. <laughs> this is a bad thing. Um, so um, if you want to take a brief moment of fun, find your own personality type um, and look through it and see which one, which personality types it thinks you should be with and which one you think you should avoid. Um, if anybody's curious, I have a hypothesis about the creator of this chart. I believe the creator of this chart has ENTJ preferences. If you'll notice, it's the only column without any bad results which strikes me as something that perhaps somebody with ENTJ preferences with low self-development who is making a chart about who should be together might determine is that of course they're correct and everyone else is wrong. By the way, all of us could make that mistake on a side note, but uh, that's my theory is, is that the ENTJ is yielding without a problem. Um, so in looking at this chart, if anybody wants to uh, um, just speak up, we have a small group here or put it in a chat. Um, uh, uh, how is this chart's accuracy for your relationships? Is it actually kind of accurate for your relationships? Now that would be by you know coincidence, but is it kind of accurate for yours or is it totally inaccurate for your relationships and your friendships? Accurate for me. Accurate for you, great. Well, I guess from Daniel, we have a, it is terrible in the chat. Great. Mm -hmm. Laura is saying it's inaccurate. Yeah, Sharon is saying she's celebrating Ian her 43rd year of marriage with her INTP husband. 
And uh, let's see how that goes. Uh, according to this little chart here, that's actually not a bad combination. So that's at least good. So I mean, it's not that there isn't some truth to, to some of these ideas. The question is, is that is the deep concern that it's predetermined, meaning that it can't be successful. Um, so, um, by the way, in case you can be curious, I've just sub, this is a, this is the best combination according to that chart. So if you want to, you, you could look at it this way as a way, uh, um, there you go. My husband is awesome. Just not, not just okay. Thank you, Sharon. Yes. This chart says he's only going to be okay. <laughs> um, so another kind of challenge is any kind of tip, what I like to think of as tit for tat models and relationships. So I called them X times. Why didn't they call me X times? Or I always do Y for them. I always do the dishes. Why don't they do the dishes for me? And the, there is an idea behind this, which is the idea of mutual support. And that is very true. Mutual support in, in broadly is super vital. However, but expecting that support will look exactly the same from one person to other is a significant misplaced expectation. It's kind of like assuming that because my type is good at something, you should be good at that. And if you're not good at that, you're terrible. Right, it's a it's a really wrong, bad way to think about that. So now, why type as a, a a a solution to come look to in the situations like this? Well, one is it's incredibly good at helping people unhook their expectations in relationships. That's a really massive value brings the table. Uh, in fact, the title of this book almost captures that immediately by Isabel Briggs Myers and Peter Myers: Gifts Differing. That's an important concept that can really help people with expectations. Or another one is, I'm not crazy, I'm just not you. So even the titles of the books themselves are really presenting this amazing core concept. And so if type can just help people to get to that core idea, you've already been wildly successful with type. <laughs> Regardless of whether they remember their specific type or not. If they just remember that just because they're not the same as someone else or someone doesn't think the way they do, that it's okay, then you've already had a wildly successful use of type. So we want to get people to this idea. Oh, I have one way of doing things and you have a different way and that's okay. If we can just make that happen, we're great. So in this core idea it can be very transformational, like in the workplace. My coworkers are not doing that thing because they hate me. It's probably just because they have their own approach. Or another way to phrase this is from the Toltecs, the four agreements, don't take anything personally because it's, which says it's not about you. It's about their own needs, their own preferences. So, but unfortunately our thingery of mind, we are naturally psychologically programmed to think that that thing they're doing is about me. <laughs> but I, I'm sorry to say, it's probably not about you. Um, so you can also like to phrase this. He thought of marriage was as a significant driver of individuation. There's a link to an article by Jung about this. So he thought as you're really your most intimate relationships are the ones that are going to push you the most to develop. And anybody who's been in type um, and been in a significant relationship for a long time will probably agree wholeheartedly that their significant romantic relationships are the ones that also push them heavily to develop um, uh, in this process. So again, I say to you, the greatest return on investment of time and energy you can make in your life comes from your investing in your deep relationships, these valuable relationships in your life. For your and their personal development, happiness and satisfaction, and physical health. So now we're going to get to the meat. 19 solutions for you in the wake of COVID-19. So on a quick side note, I'm going to give a couple ground rules across all the solutions. So first of all, we're taking a multiple model approach to relationships. So we're going to look at how you can use different models in different ways to help you in relationships with the idea that it's about finding the right solution and the right model that will help you in that relationship. So you might find one model is great for helping you with one person, but for another person, you might want to use a different psychological model to help you resolve uh, any conflict or issues you have. In addition, we're going to use other models outside of the traditional realm of type conferences. So these are typically not APT related models, but they're very valuable in this particular context. So number one, rule number one, um, by the way, as a reminder, you will get a nice checklist at the end of this with an action for each one of these. So just don't worry, you will get a nice checklist for this. Make a commitment to never stop improving yourself. 
And by that, I mean, be patient with yourself and others. You will get better in relationships, but no matter how much you work at it, you're never going to get perfect. No matter how much I know not to get frustrated when somebody says something that's critical of me, that doesn't mean I'm always responding emotionally in the way I wish I would. Now, rule number two, don't make assumptions. This is one of the big things from the four agreements. Um, you know, uh, four agreement rule number three, don't make assumptions. Um, and this is the same idea with that theory of mind. If you start making guesses about other people, then that's where you're potentially making, putting yourself at great risk of making mistakes in your relationship. Number three, be vulnerable. If you're not already familiar, that uh, Brene Brown has done some amazing work on this topic of being vulnerable. Um, she has both a TED Talk, um, a Netflix special, which I've seen, and apparently a new HBO special that I've not seen yet. So, um, uh, and more than 10 plus books. Um, and uh, it's really her, a lot of what she talks about is you have to just be willing to be open and talk about what matters to you and share what you need. And all three of the above require being vulnerable. And you might find one of the three above easier than some of the others, but really being vulnerable means doing all three of those. Being open, talk about what matters to you and share what you need. Because telling people what you really need can be very um, threatening to your sense of independence. And I don't need any help and I'm good, but we all need help in our life. And being able to share that to other people can be very hard and very valuable. Further, don't assume people you know what your needs or what you want, that theory of mind. They're probably making mistakes right now when they're guessing why you did something. <laughs> the same reason you're making mistakes. They're making mistakes about you. So the only way you can clear that up is if you clearly tell them why you are doing the things you're doing. So Brene Brown tells us we need to express our needs and concerns. And if we have not done that, if we've not told that person our needs and concerns, then the only person we have to blame if our needs are not being met is ourselves. <laughs> we haven't done the work to make our relationships better. So I think it's just an amazing concept. Number four, be brave, ask questions. It can be scary. Um, and this also is a corollary to don't make assumptions. If you're not making assumptions, then you need to ask questions. And pretty much every solution and tip in this book requires communication with other people. Flat. End of discussion. Which means you have to be willing to open your mouth, be brave, and ask questions, even if it means that there is a risk that you might look silly or vulnerable. It's worth it to that take that embrace that risk to be brave and ask those questions. Number five, follow the platinum rule. The platinum rule, do unto others as they would have done unto them, not treat others as you would like others to treat you. This is one of those big gotchas of the theory of mind and culture. We always talk about the golden rule, treat others as you would want to be treated. But it turns out the more you know about type, the more you know that that's probably wrong. <laughs> there are 16 types. What's the chance that the person or the other person on the other side of me wants the exact same things I want? Actually, statistically, not real great. <laughs> Odds are they actually want something different. So look, embrace that. By the way, Best way to find out what they actually want, especially when you don't know their type, be brave, ask their question, ask them what they want. All right, how do you know they want to be treated? Another way to do that is number six, make your own operating manual and then share it. Most of us in the modern world have gotten operating manuals or instructions on something. Well, make an instruction manual for you. So, this is a guidebook for you that then you can share with the other people in your life. Create a document, a set, it could be a digital document, it could be a notebook, a journal, whatever. It's a set of materials that helps people understand your needs, expectations, and preferences. Sometimes it's much easier to write it all down and share it that way, rather than having to say it out loud. Sometimes it's easier because if you're like me, you think of things in a moment and then you forget about them later. So having one place where they're all written out so you don't forget about them later, and you have a way to share that and say, by the way, here are the things that matter to me, and I care enough about you to share this with you. Something to give and share with the people in your life that matter. So it's really got two purposes. 
one, it, okay, so here's a secret. It's actually about helping yourself understand yourself better. As you're making the operating manual, you are thinking about yourself and really doing some self-development thinking. But it also helps you create a better dialogue with other people in your life. And that's really one of the biggest challenges is that things are not talked enough about in relationships, or at least the right things. And this really helps you focus on what really matters. Um, and that's one of the biggest problems with all misplaced expectations. They're not talked about at all. So any strategy of these 19 solutions that get you to talk with the vital people in your life about expectations and what you need and they need is a good step. All right. Number seven, help people unhook their expectations. So obviously you can be releasing your own attachment to your own expectations. Um, for yourself or your own relationships. But that's this is one of the things, the biggest things you can do as a coach or counselor, or if like you are somebody who is working on your development in your life, you can take this opportunity to learn your, use, leverage your own development and help others around you, right? It's not just about putting, as they put in airplanes, putting your own mask, get masks on. put your own mask on, but then you should be helping other people put their oxygen masks on. And that's what this is about. So helping people release their own attachment to their own expectations. And by the way, that's where I think psychological models and types are amazing. It helps people really identify those similarities and differences, helps them grasp that not everyone thinks alike. And it could be expectations and preferences, but there's a lot of different ways to just help somebody realize that there's similarities and differences between you and them. Number eight. In case you were not, now you're the kind of person at this conference, you're probably already into this one, but get type resources. What you may not be aware of is there's some pretty good type resources that are specifically designed for relationships. So around whole types, this is probably my favorite book called Just Your Type, if you're not familiar with it. Um, I'm going to warn you, it's a little bit like a reference manual if you've not seen it already because it literally goes through every combination of types, more than 130 combinations, and then talks about joys, frustrations, and what, what uh, each one can do for the other type in a way to make the relationship better. So it is unbelievable. But if you're buying it for yourself, just realize you're probably going to use like four pages out of this book. <laughs> but don't worry, I'm telling you those four pages are worth it. Now, you also worth going around to the people in your life and sharing them. There's probably a period of my time early in my type history where I literally carried this book around and would force all my friends to look at this book. Here's an example of converting what's in that book into something that removes the type language, but instead just makes it friendly version. By the way, Melissa is my partner. She has INFP preferences. I have ENTP preferences. So, so you can see one of the things that I can do as someone with ENTP for Melissa's at first item is never dismiss Melissa's feelings, even if they don't make sense or seem too extreme to you. Um, and, you know, then over on the right, what Melissa can do for me is help keep it fun. Try not to get stuck in serious mode for too long. And so this can be amazing. And by the way, any relationship that's seated for a while is probably already doing some of these, but it's sometimes just great to have the reminder to do them. So there's some other great type relationships books. And uh, thank you, Sharon. I think you popped this up. Uh, short, we'll get to this in a second. Intimacy and Type um, is one. Another one by Susan Nash, Dating, Mating, Relating. Um, 16 Ways to Love Your Lover, which Sharon just mentioned by Otto Kreger and Janet Thusen, um, if I said that right. Um, the Heart Stores have a book for relationship counselors. So if you are a counselor, there's literally a book, book entire book for how to use type with your, with your uh, couples as a counselor. Uh, Mark Majors has his book, Dichotomies for Dyads. But also, we're here to talk about the multiple model push relationships. Those are all very type-focused books, and they're great, and they're awesome. And I'm a big fan of and, by the way. And um, I'm, we're looking for multiple model approach relationships. So this is about finding similarities and differences across multiple models. So another one that I love, nine, use essential motivators. Some people know this is temperament. I think this is amazing in relationships because it really does a great job of helping look at core needs. And we've been discussing about how to talk about needs with your partner. So this can sometimes give you great language to talk about your needs with other people in your life. So it's, a, but I also like to add, it's especially powerful to dig one layer deeper and look at the dynamics as identified by Linda Behrens. 
So this is called Essential Motivators Dynamics and it's in her book. Um, if you're familiar with the names here, um, what I'm caring about is the dynamics. So both rational and stabilizer have a preference for structure. Both catalyst and improviser have a preference for motive. Catalyst and rational have a preference for abstract. Improviser and stabilizer have a preference for concrete. And then you can see that a diagonally, you can see affiliative is true for catalyst and stabilizer and pragmatic for rational improviser. And these dynamics play out very strongly in long-term deep relationships. I'll give you some examples. So motive and structure, if you're not familiar, I have some code up at the top so you can decode what when you are if you're not familiar with these models already and some of the similar names. So from people with a motive preference, after someone makes a mistake, it's most important is clear how authentically sorry they are. This is what matters most. However, if someone has a structure preference, after someone makes a mistake, it is more important to talk about how the mistake will not be repeated. This is a challenge between my partner and I. I'm focused on how we cannot repeat it. She wants to know how sorry I am. And if we're not talking about the same thing, then that's a problem. Um, by the way, you will notice that most general advice on how to say you're sorry includes both of these as how to make a proper apology. There's a reason why. It's because you, by doing both, you're making sure you're succeeding on both aspects of those preferences. The best apologies do both. Another way to think about that is affiliative or pragmatic. An affiliative preference says, of course, you always attend family celebrations. And pragmatic says, of course, you intend important and convenient celebrations. Eh, if it's not important and not very convenient, eh, you'd probably skip it. And you can see how that could also be a challenge between potentially my partner and I, that that would be something that we have a different way of thinking about how we connect with other people in our lives. And that can make a big difference in your relationships. To begin to see how these dynamics can have significant impact on where you have challenges in your relationships, I think it's fantastic. Another way to think about this from a work relationship standpoint is affiliative. Of course, you are respectful of all teammates and their time, especially those who have earned their position. The pragmatic viewpoint says, of course, you're respectful of the few, few people who are really earned it, regardless of position. Um, and for those of you who are um, for abstract and concrete, they're not exactly, but you can use a lot of the uh, tips you already know from the world of type, whole type, around intuition and sensing to think about how to think about that. But if you're only looking at essential motivators and just those preference scales, you're going to miss some of the wonderful challenges we want to surface. So if you have an ENTJ and an INTJ that are both theorists in a relationship or an ESTJ and ISTJ plus stabilizers, um, there are more differences than just E and I going on. So tip number 10, use interaction styles. If you're not familiar, it's not surprising that a model in interaction styles would be useful in your vital relationships but it's especially powerful to dig one layer deeper in these relationships and look at the dynamics as identified by Linda Behrens. So uh, this is Catherine Stotzhart's nice little chart that talks about the four interaction styles. And again, you will notice that across the top coming down, you have slightly different um, indicators of you know, direction giving, information giving. From the left-hand side, you have responding or initiating. And then diagonally, you have outcome, and process. So these are different dynamics that cut across the different. So note, with every other person, you're going to have some dynamics you share and almost always likely some dynamics you don't share. So informing. This is all about a preference for loving giving choice. And a failure to get that space of choice from others may feel like the other person is being domineering or is being bad. But directing communication is often about being clear. And so failure to do that, to be clear by others can be seen as being passive aggressive or making you guess. And that can feel very bad and frustrating. So you can see how both dynamics can be frustrated when they only get the other one. So by the way, I think this last one, my, if you were to pick one dynamic across all six we're gonna talk about today, across essential motivators and this is the one I think potentially matters most, all of them, is how you communicate, because it affects how you communicate with your partner, 
which as we discussed is vital to everything. Are you directing them to do things? Are you informing them about something about you? Um, you know, a good example of informing might be, oh, I noticed out of, we're out of eggs today. What are they probably really communicating when they say, I think we're out of eggs today? Anyone want to volunteer? But somebody, if informing what they mean by we're out of eggs? Um, it's asking, can you go and get eggs later? Okay. But I'll, I'll go if you want me to go and right. you don't want to go. Yeah. That's right. It's an informing, we're out of eggs, inviting a discussion of choice to participate, right? Um, while someone with a directing communication would say, hey, we're out of eggs, put it on the shopping list or go get eggs tomorrow, right? Uh, so both of these, uh, uh, and so that's a great example of, you, you know, that you have to kind of sometimes read into when you know what the style is for the other person. Um, so one of my personal tricks as someone with informing is to make a suggestion and then I do the extra work to say, if no one has any opinion, I have a slight preference for, or I notice we're out of eggs um, and then I have to pause, spend the extra effort and go, would, I could go get them if you don't want to, right? I have to notice it still comes across very informing. I could go get them, but I at least take a step towards now describing what the preference is. Another way is process and outcome. So process is the conversation or process discussion was the important thing, or at least having a process to follow, not what was decided. <laughs> outcome says what was really important is we get the best result or an achievable result, not how we got there. <laughs> Maybe I just decided for you and implemented the results. But the process says what was most important was we decided together, not how great the decision was. <laughs> um, and for initiating and responding, um, this one is often very much tied in with extroversion, introversion preferences. So if you're already familiar with a lot of those tips, those are going to be very useful in thinking about initiating and responding, right? Initiating, needing time to think about it, responding, needing time to consider it, to talk about it. So I recommend people have what I like to call a dynamic discussion. By this, I mean, just have a good discussion and go through each of the dynamics of that we just talked about with your people in your life for somebody who's important and talk about how it affects your relationship. So if you have the same dynamic, you can talk about how it's creating blind spots that you're both informing and neither of you are directing. Or you might have you discussing how you might be overusing that dynamic. We're doing too much directing and discuss what strategy you should use to address this or the reverse if you have a different dynamic. Number 11, leverage the five love languages. So this is a great model for understanding how and why you want to show appreciation and love. Gary Chapman has his book, The Five Love Languages. Um, I'm going to warn people, has a lot of religious and heteronormative biases, but the underlying model itself is very sound. Just in the first book, it's based upon Gary has a lot of his bias and expectations. If you're looking for something that's more generalized, Paul White, who is, by the way, a type-friendly expert um, and has done work with type, has written a book with Paul uh, Gary Chapman focused on the workplace. So it's going to be a lot more neutral. If you're looking for something that's going to be more neutral, I recommend that book. But it's the same underlying model of the five languages. And so it's really a type for how you show your love to others and like to be shown that. So here are the five types. Words of affirmation, quality time, giving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. Um, and by the way, when we're first starting to date, you tend to do all of them because you're just, you've got all this energy in the relationship. But then over time, you tend to focus on just showing your love in one or two ways. Set more often in a way that, here's how I want love, so that's how I show it to the other person. But unfortunately, unless you're very lucky, that's not how they wanted to receive their love. Um, so um, here is a quick description of each of them. And I want you to look at this list and I want you to be thinking about which one is your preferred love language and which one is your least preferred. So look through these five and I want you to decide which one is most you and which one is probably least you.
right? If the Sarah, if you want to pop up that first poll. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and pause it there. So there you go. Words of affirmation, quality time, access service. Mine is actually physical touch. Um, you know, that, yeah. So therefore, whenever I'm with my partner, I, we're often holding hands, I'm reaching over to touch her shoulder. You know, we're sitting on the couch watching a show, I'm, I'm reaching a hand over to touch her, right? It's that physical touch that really drives, is really valuable for me. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and uh, if you'll show up the next poll for your least preferred. By the way, quality time is my second. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share the results there. There you go, gifts, giving gifts. By the way, gift giving, giving gifts is my worst as well. I have to literally make calendar appointments in my calendar to remember to get occasional small just gifts for my partner because that matters to her. So that was my trick was I had to go literally make a calendar appointment to remember to go buy gifts. All right, number 12. Make a habit of Gottman's solutions to the four horsemen. Um, so he calls them the antidotes to the four horsemen. So for criticism, you want to do a gentle startup, talk about your feelings using the I statements. For contempt, you want to build a culture of appreciation, regularly reminding yourself of your partner's positive qualities, and especially just expressing gratitude to them for the things they do you love. Thank you for doing the dishes. I really appreciate it. Defensiveness. Take responsibility, accept your partner's perspective and offer an apology authentically. Um, and for against stonewalling, do physiological self-soothing. Take a break and spend time doing soothing and distracting things rather than trying to keep going, forcing yourself to go through that when you find yourself starting to stonewall. And he's also identified a number of other great solutions in his book, Science of Trust. Number 13, apply the four tendencies. Um, this is a model by Gretchen Rubin, which is how do I respond to expectations of others of me? So it affects both work and relationships. And it looks at two kinds of thoughts, outer expectations and inner expectations. So think of it this way, starting at the top, the upholder is a person who meets outer expectations. My boss expects this of me and meets inner expectations. I made a commitment to myself to work out. The obliger meets outer expectations. Nope, my boss asked me to do it. I'm going to definitely do it but resist inner expectations. I keep telling myself I'm gonna work out, but I just can't force myself to go do it. <laughs> Rebel resists both. And finally, questioner resists outer expectations meets inner expectations. An example might that be, I don't care that my boss told me to go do it, who cares? Oh wait, I have decided there's a good rational reason to do it. Well then great, I'm on a board, I'll make it happen. So there is a quiz. You can go, there's a free quiz on her website. So you can just go there and take the quiz for yourself and your partners and figure out your, how you see in expectations and tendencies. So the name of the model suggests the tendencies. So it does not assume that you do it all the time, but just how do you tend to respond to expectations and has a huge impact on relationships. Knowing that pattern and how you work with it can be vital in helping working with someone else. And convenient for all of us, her book is filled with concrete examples and specific language you can use to help people, no matter what, uh, model, what they are. Number 14, be conscious of what stories you are telling yourselves. I like to think of this as the Jungian archetypes perspective. Um, Carol Pearson and uh, um, Mar have done some great work on this. And there's a lot of real truth to the fact that stories we tell ourselves can be very significant in how we live our lives and whether we see our life as being satisfying and fulfilling or being frustrating. It's the stories we tell each other. So there's a PMI instrument, AI instrument, you go to CAP4. Um, it's really about helping you determine the dominant stories that are compelling each of you in this process and then looking at how that compares. Number 15, learn from the Enneagram. So the Enneagram model has a lot to say on about dealing with difficulty and your own struggles. Um, within the type community, uh, Mark Bernardzik has the Breckenridge Enneagram. 
where he's done a lot of scientific work and aligns it very closely with the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it's very well done. Um, also, Pat Wyman has a book on three keys to self-understanding that try to looks at some integration here. Another way, this is kind of a workbook. So if you, I feel like it's very approachable to a lot of circumstances, but nine ways of working that I think is just very good overall in thinking about yourself and your own development. 16, remember, it's not about you. So back to rule two from the four agreements, the Toltecs, uh, Toltec four agreements, don't take anything personally. When people lash out, it's probably because of their own stuff. So when they're being lashing out and cruel and mean, it's probably not about you. Unfortunately, it doesn't feel like that when they're yelling at you, trust me, right? But it probably has to do with some of their own issues. And, and so uh, this can be all about handling difficult times. So we can guarantee you and your partner, your loved ones will go through difficult times and there's no need to make them harder. And when they lash out, there's no need to lash out back. Um, there's a wonderful book called Crucial Conversations that's all about this, how to talk when the stakes are high, when it's really intense. It's a great book on how to have conversations when it's a difficult time. And there are a lot of great resources available to help yourself or others deal with this. Some of those we're gonna talk about number 17, Monitoring Stress and Stressors. One of my favorite books in the grip by Naomi Quick, which is all about uh, your dominant function, your inferior function, and then stressors. Another one is Sandra Von Sant's Wired for Conflict or Damien Killen and Danica Murphy's Introduction to Type and Conflict. All of these have great content on your own stressors and how to monitor for them and look for them. 18, monitor, financial monitor your financial stress and stressors. One of the most significant impacts to all close relationships can be financial stress. There's a wonderful book using temperament by Ray Linder called What Will I Do With My Money? That's all about how you can look at this. And finally, 19, get more resources. So uh, here's some quick list of some things that are very for, for good for specific vital relationships for like kids and teens. Um, uh, can be extra complicated to talk to kids when they don't know themselves, but there's some really great stuff in Nurture by Nature, Mary McGinnis's book, My Personality and, or Mother Styles. For teens, there's a great, there's two products, two Blair's Personality Puzzle for Teens and Discovering Type with Teens by a number of authors, including Molly Allen. Um, also, from a community standpoint, thinking about typing community, Greg Costco's book, Making a Difference by Being Yourself. And, you know, finally, for best friends or business partners, the broader set of type and models tools are all very applicable here. And really, it's great for all kinds of relationships, like Roger Pierman's Type and Emotional Intelligence, or Donna Dunning's Type and Communication. And finally, for counselors, for grief, um, there's recovery from loss available from CAPT. So in conclusion, what is your response to COVID going to be? to make your relationship stronger and better. What are you gonna to do to do that? So what is your response as we live in a new normal? Are you gonna be building new relationships or focused on deepening existing relationships? Either are great. And so will you start a new habit? Will you reinvigorate friendships? Did you start a habit during COVID that has really helped some of your relationships and you now want to find a way to maintain that habit? Or how are you gonna join a social community safely? So COVID was a major disruption. So can you take advantage of that disruption to make your life better? It shook things up. Use it as an opportunity to make proactive good changes in your life. So as I said before, the greatest return on your investment of time and energy you can make in your life comes from investing in your deep personal relationships. You know, for you and your loved ones, personal development, happiness and satisfaction and physical health. So most of the strategies we talked about really have two purposes understand yourself better and create a better dialogue with others. And honestly, everything you're gonna learn in an APT conference is fantastic for these two things. And any strategy to get you to talk with the people in your life about what's important is a great step. Now, as a reminder, be patient with yourself and others. You will get better, but no worries. It's you're never gonna hit perfect. Don't, don't worry about it. And finally, you know, be willing to be open, talk about what matters to you, share what you move, be brave and vulnerable. Um, Afrund distilled his relationship wisdom to me in this way, as he described it. He said, when challenged in a relationship and you are unsure what is the right direction, what is the correct ethical discussion direction, he said to move in the direction that requires the greatest courage. And I've never had this idea fail me. That really, when I look at a tough choice, what's the, is it, does it require greater courage to authentically talk with the person and tell them what's really happened? Yes, do it. Um, 
handouts. So by the way, as a reminder, you're going to get two handouts. Um, we'll be able on the website for download also from the slides. Is one is one that goes through, it's just a single page. It goes through all 19, lists them out, and gives you a specific action you can take for that on an ongoing basis to improve it. So separate from what I've talked about in the thing today. Um, so there's 19 ways to do that. And I also made a resource checklist. I know I covered a whole bunch of books and materials. So you in this PDF, there are links, direct links, as well as links to all of the books and their authors already compiled into one easy to make check page and checklist for you. So I, I know I gave you a whole lot, but I wanted to make it as easy as possible for you to go about your life and leverage these wonderful things in your life. So uh, uh, there is, you're welcome, of course, to reach out to me, contact at stepresearch.com if you have any questions. Um, all these should be available as PDFs on the back website. And um, we've got a few minutes for questions. And as long as Sarah will stay here, I will happily stay here longer into the break if people want to chat or have questions. Thank you very much indeed, Sterling. That's great. Shall I stop the recording now? Sure, I think that's great. Okay.